video about how to read the Norse calendar. Behold, a Norse calendar with all the holidays, dates, celebrations, and even a guide here uh, included as to how we today can practice these ancient traditions. Guys, a calendar like this has never existed before now, and for good reason. I and many others for many years wanted to create some type of calendar like this. But the research with it and the organization is a really a monumental task and finding a designer who is actually willing to take on the project and patient enough to do it, it just made this project impossible. But a couple of months back a designer actually came to me, an amazing guy who wanted to undertake this very difficult design. He doesn't even do it for a living, he does it for fun and he's a fellow pagan, he's one of us, he doesn't have a website or anything, social media, all he wanted to do was create a Norse calendar and get it out there uh, to the world. So guys remember his name, Lucas O'Neill from England fellow pagan. The research was done by me, of course, and I had these things planned for a long time, but uh, Lucas was the one who brought it to life, so thank him down in the comments below. Uh, don't worry, I did pay him very well too, so be assured he has been rewarded uh, by more than just the gratitude of the pagan community, but he deserves everyone's thanks as well. So, so even though the calendar is really a, a, a damn near perfect design, and we made it to be super easy to read and follow along with the data, some of this is going to take some explanation and that's what I'm doing on this video here because guys today this calendar and any other Norse calendar at the end of the day is reconstructed we don't know what the calendar was actually in pagan times maybe they had a calendar or maybe they had none or maybe they had just some half a calendar and no one really used it we don't know and I know a lot of people really like to get their panties up in a bunch about historically accurate uh, holidays and dates. The truth is that we just don't know these things from ancient times. Uh, me and, and all other Norse experts, we would all reconstruct these calendars in a slightly different way. The point is though, is that they should be based on the sources. Uh, the sources that we do have because we really do have a whole bunch of sources and I, for one, have never seen a calendar as comprehensive as the one that Lucas and I uh, created. So every single detail here is either directly linked to the sources, or at least can be explained uh, with the sources that we have. And, and look here, the sources are all actually listed right at the bottom of this flag, like I always do. Sources are so, so important. So let's get on to the explanations. Okay, so first we can look at how beautifully Lucas lined up the months on our Gregorian calendar with the Norse months. The Norse, along with every other ancient people, went by the moons. And this is actually what the word moon means. We still say Mona in Norwegian and all the other Germanic languages, moon means month. Now, it's a bit debated among scholars uh, whether the new month would start on the new moon or the full moon. So I chose on this calendar to make it start on the full moon because the Germanic tribes actually believe that the new day started at sunset. Source for that is uh, Germania by Tacitus. Uh, so assuming the new moon would also start when the moon was setting or waning. So that's why I chose to do it that way. Also the fact that the blutes, the sacrifices and the major festivals, they would all take place on the full moon. And that's also when their new year and seasons would start. And the winter season, according to Bede, the reckoning of time and a lot of Norse sources that suggest the same thing. So I made the full moon signifying uh, each new month on here. Also look what we did. All full moons and lunar holidays are marked in red and with red uh, lines and the solar holidays are marked in yellow and the kind of off holidays are marked in blue. So this brings us to October 9th, the coming full moon and just about a month from today when this video is going to be released. This is where our calendar starts and this is our New Year's celebration in the North world. Now the months uh, we used uh, the same as the traditional Icelandic calendar. Calendar, uh, for that most of you have seen those names of months and this one actually does come from an old source dating to the 1100s um, but some are a bit conflicting we don't know but in general they tend to agree that these months are uh, named after the ones we did on this calendar 
So for our calendar, I did make two changes to those uh, months, however, that you see on the Icelandic calendar. First change, I changed the name of this one, Thordi, to Julamonadur, uh, the month of Jul. Christmas, which was changed in the Viking Age due to a Christian king, which I will go over in just a minute. And there's also an Anglo-Saxon source calling this month uh, Giola, which is the uh, old uh, English uh, cognate of the word Yule. So Christmas month uh, is what it would have been called, something like that. And remember, the Anglo-Saxons and the Norse were the same pagan religion if we go back far enough in time. Oh, so this is not just a Norse calendar, but it can be considered a Germanic calendar. I just used the uh, Norse names uh, that are in here. Also, uh, another change to the months, I added a 13th month. You see, with a lunar calendar, it's always going to be falling behind on the solar cycles, right? So 12 uh, moons is always going to be uh, shorter than the solar cycles. So every three or four years, what the people would do in ancient times is that they would look at the lunar and solar cycles and they would decide if they would need to add an extra month in the middle of the summer. Again, that's according to Bede. And also the Primstav shows this, that some years can have a leap uh, month or 13th month. We are in one of those years right now, guys, actually. So an additional moon, additional month is needed to catch the lunar cycle, uh, lunar um, calendar up to the uh, solar cycle. And this moon was added to the 10th moon, so this is going to be right in the middle of the summer here. The Romans also did this in their pagan times before the Julian calendar. All humans probably did this at one point, added a leap month in there. We don't know what this extra month or moon was called in the Norse world, but the Romans called this extra month Mercedonius, and that directly translated means work month. So that's what I called this uh, month here in Old Norse, Irkja Monotur, or work month. So final part of the months, look how beautifully Lucas recorded the waxing and waning of the moons. This is for a very good reason, it's because most rituals and practices should be done on the waxing moon, the time where it's going up to a full moon and not the waning. There are Scandinavian folk traditions recording all these kinds of rituals, but it can also be seen on the Egya runestone from Viking times. So definitely take notice of the moons, uh, waxing and waning and when is the full moon but check your local time in your area these dates are going to be right on here but the full moon will come at a different time of day uh, depending on where you are in the world but yeah these lines all perfectly line up with the days on the Gregorian calendar, so it's easy to keep track of just by counting the lines on which day versus which uh, Norse month on to the holidays at the start of the year in the Norse religion, this is Vetternatur, uh, or Vetternuttum. So winter nights, this is October 9th, the full moon coming up uh, just in a few weeks. This is the new year begins, it's when the winter begins. It's a three-day ce celebration and feast, and this is by far the most attested source in all the Norse sagas, uh, the sources in the Viking Ages. It's also told about in Bede's account of the Anglo-Saxons, and they called this month uh, Winterfellith. It's a sacrifice for a good year, according to Heimskringla, and and Inglinga Saga. It's uh, cattle sacrifice is what usually would be done. It could be the Alpha Blut, Disa Blut, so sacrifices to the elves and the uh, female ancestral spirits. Uh, some sagas, uh, these are practiced here, but it could also be done at other times of year, as I will speak about later. But yeah, in general, all over the world, it's a time to honor the ancestors. We have this done really all over the world, and we have records in Scandinavian folk tradition of of doing this uh, until just up uh, up till about 200 years ago actually you can leave food and drink on the ancestors graves you can practice utiseta or connect with ancestors you can do trick-or-treat, you can gather gifts from neighboring farms to offer at the sacrifices coming. This could be the origin of trick-or-treating. Children at this holiday should also dress up as ancestral spirits or ancestral figures. Um, and also even birds or, you know, uh, winged costumes like that are a good idea as ancestral spirits are sometimes believed to uh, take the shape of birds in the afterlife. The wild hunt 
This is traditionally done in uh, folk tales around Christmas or New Year's, but there's some evidence that it was originally done in pagan times and, and practiced right now actually in the pagan uh, Norse New Year's. So now is a good time to go hunting if you want to do that today. Also, this last one, don't shave or cut your hair until the winter solstice. You know, the no shave November thing, Movember. Uh, yeah, we think that could be a very ancient tradition too, related to the story of Odin's son, Vali. I did a video on that that you can check out. It relates to sympathetic magic, you know, basically when everything in nature is dying, all the crops and harvests and plants and trees, they're not growing. So what we do is we humans let our hair and our beards grow until the sun comes back to life when Baldur returns at the uh, winter solstice. Go see my videos on that if you haven't already for a bigger explanation. Next holiday we have Advent. Uh, very popular back home in Norway, um, uh, but it has those traditions in other places in the world too. It's thought to be a Christian thing, but guys, if there's anything I want you to take from this calendar and the Norse traditions, Realize that 90% or more of Christian holidays were originally pagan. The Christians just changed the dates and names a lot of the time to help convert the people and stop them from practicing their pagan traditions. But the traditions are not Christian, okay? The ones that we do, they do not come from the desert. And this is one of them like most of the others. So Advent is supposed to start four weeks before the winter solstice and 40 days before Yule, which... This year it lines up perfectly, but sometimes it's not uh, quite that easy. You can hang up Julekanse, or the Christmas wreath, uh, just like you do regular Christmas time. You can bake Kransekakje, or Kringle, uh, circular cookies or pastries uh, that symbolizes all these circular types of things, symbolize the returning uh, solar cycles. Um, you can put up a Christmas tree and also do it with as much red decorations as possible, because uh, this symbolizes the blood and the life force. And you can do all these other Christmas traditions, guys. And, you know, the, these things, <laughs> I don't have to tell anyone already, these Christmas traditions that we all practice, they do not come from the desert, okay? These are Northern European originals that have probably been celebrated for thousands of years. So you can really just celebrate leading up to Christmas as you normally would, um, uh, but the proper date would be starting at the Advent right here. Then we have Vettersolvajf, the winter solstice. This year it's on December 21st. This is not Yule, okay? These fake pagans a few decades ago took the Wiccan wheel and put it here uh, as Yule, but this was never the original pagan Yule. Yule was at the next full moon after the winter solstice. It was not on the solstice. The Christian king of Norway in the Viking Age, Håkon the Good, actually moved Yule back to Jesus' birthday in our modern calendar of December in order to Christianize the Norwegians of the time, but Yule is really next month. Now, there are really no sources from the Viking Age saying that the winter solstice was celebrated at all, but of course it was. All ancient peoples celebrated the solar cycles. This was the magnificent rebirth of the sun, so important, and this return of the sun is the only reason that we could survive back then. If the sun didn't come back, we were all dead in the north of Europe, <laughs> hence the story of Baldr and Jagnarök. So we don't know how it was celebrated in pagan times, but we have things recorded in Scandinavian folk tradition, like hanging up mistletoe in the doorway, and don't hang it up before the winter solstice, actually. Uh, we collect the mistletoe at the equinox, as I will speak about in a minute, but don't hang it up until the solstice, okay? I'll tell you why. Next one, you can decorate with lights. This has been a long tradition in the north of Europe. You can do song and dance. You can bake and eat uh, lussekatter or saffron buns. This also represents the uh, solar cycles. Uh, you can make and drink glug or glühwein in German. This also represents the blood and the life force coming back. You can, another tradition recorded, you can mix glug with honey and you can coat a wild tree with it. 
You can also do a Yule log. You can chop down a uh, tree outside and bring a log in to light it in the fireplace. And you can also carve it with runes if you want to. And guys, a great book for all these folk traditions is called Vår Traditioner by Vegard Surheim. He does an amazing job at recording these folk traditions. Some of them are from as little as one or two hundred years ago. And he relates them to pagan times and the symbolism that is all in there. And he's a great guy too, and he actually helped me out with a couple of parts on this calendar where I got stuck. So get his book, I definitely recommend that. Uh, there's an English version of it now, and that will be in the description if anyone wants it. Also, uh, at the winter solstice, you can light bonfires on the hills and mountaintops. Uh, there are some ancient Greek historians that wrote about this on their uh, travels to Scandinavia. Uh, also, a popular Swedish folk tradition, you can leave food out for the household Nisse or Tumta. Uh, watch my video about how to do that in the uh, historical way. Uh, you can also practice Orsgang, uh, mostly a Swedish tradition, or the yearly walk that you would get prophecies and wisdom from. You can also visit uh, Neolithic graves or monuments if possible if you near live nearby any, because many of them uh, line up the perfect lights on the winter solstice too. Then we are on to Yule, or Yule as uh, people call it today. It's January 6th, the full moon uh, this year. Now, there are many, many sources about Yule. Heimskringla, Ingninga Saga, Halfdan the Black Saga, Harald Fairhair's Saga, Håkon the Good Saga. I did a whole video on what the sources say about Yule that you can check out if you want. Um, but yeah, here are some festivities that have been recorded. A three-day celebration and feast. No fighting. Fighting was strictly forbidden. You know, violence or war at these times of year. Sacrifice for a good crop. Uh, so a good crop, the sacrifice would be to our god Freyr if you are doing that. Also uh, sacrificing uh, pork or a boar, which is Freyr's animal. Um, if you're going to do any sacrifices, a boar would be the proper one to use at this time of year. Uh, to eat it, uh, boil and eat the pork. Watch my video I did on that uh, for a recipe if you like. That's on my other channel, The Seasonal Diet. You can also drink mead, you can toast to Odin, uh, victory, you can toast to Freyr and a good harvest, you can toast to the king, and you can toast to the dead, the fallen ones. You can also swear oaths, and you can give gifts. There are sources for all of this, again, check my video uh, that I did on you, that's quite a long one. Next we have Hel Hester, or Fasterlam, as it's sometimes called. Vegard also helped me uh, with this date here. So guys, again, all of these celebrations from around this exact time of year are all very similar. The German Fasching, or the Latin or South American uh, Carnival, or the American Mardi Gras type celebrations, they are all very similar and are celebrated at this exact time of year in late February, March-ish. And it's supposed to be a Christian thing, you know, but we have plenty of records and evidence that the celebrations uh, date back to pagan originals, especially like the Fasching celebrations in Germany. There's a seven-day celebration. And this right here, guys, is probably the biggest and longest party of the year. People really get crunk around this time, <laughs> so party up. Uh, the Nachenruf, which is the local greeting that is done in uh, Germany, but there are different ones of these all over the place. Different cities, different regions have a spe special greeting that you're supposed to greet each other with at this time of year, so check to see if your area has one. 40 days. Uh, fasting begins after this time, after these parties, and you're not supposed to eat any meat. And this was not just a Christian thing, guys, but a thing all over uh, for ancient rural humans. Fasting periodically at this time of year and not eating any meat for the next 40 days. It all makes sense from an agricultural, you know, uh, livestock point of view. Follow my other channel, The Seasonal Diet, and you will know why. This time of year, we can also mock the rulers and kings there have been uh, traditions of. So this is a great time to roast any politicians that you don't like uh, in these festivities. You can also wear masks, uh, bears, wolves, or bird masks um, have been used specifically in tradition. Uh, in Brazil, uh, the uh, celebrations have done a great job at preserving these things. Also parades. 
You can eat lots of pork, Fat Tuesday, and Scandinavian tradition at this time, you make things like pancakes, bolid, uh, you can do donuts at different types of the world, king cake if you're in Mardi Gras, things like that. It's all delicious. Basically, we are using up the uh, grains and the wheats and baking these sugary cakes, and, and we're really trying to get fat before the fasting uh, begins. And finally, another tradition recorded in Scandinavia, you can hang up your winter clothes and bed sheets outside. This has to do with cleansing uh, the winter spirits off of your bed sheets and clothing uh, that are now behind us because we're welcoming uh, the sun and we're welcoming the warmth. Next holiday is called the Disablut. This one is difficult. Uh, Andreas Neuberg, um, which is probably the number one expert on Norse uh, calendars, he dates it to three full moons after the solstice, which brings us to March 7th full moon in 2023. And here we have a sacrifice to the Dísir. The female spirits, we are not 100% sure that there actually was a sacrifice at this time of year, at least not one that was practiced widely in Scandinavia. The only account of it really comes in Adam of Bremen's uh, uh, chronicle of the um, Viking Age sacrifice in Uppsala, Sweden. So it could mainly be a Swedish high festival, but what we do have records of, it's sacrificing nine of each species. It's a nine-day celebration every nine years, according to Adam of Bremen and also Theotma of Merseburg. A uh, feast, and you can go to a sacred grove if there are any near you, uh, just as there was one right near the old pagan temple of Uppsala. So that's all we know about the Disablut or Disting, as it's uh, sometimes called. Next, we have the Void Javnsnot. Uh, so the spring equinox, it's March 20th in 2023. There's not any sources about this in the uh, Norse um, world. It's more of an old English or an old Saxon pagan festival, and that we have plenty of records of. It's a feast celebrating the spring goddess. In Old English, it was called Eastre. In Old High German, it was called Ostada. Old Norse, Ostet. Uh, but that name is not uh, attested in Old Norse in any sources, um, but it is definitely an original Germanic fertility goddess. That's where our name Easter comes from, actually. I don't have to tell you this, the guys, again, you know by now, is Easter an original Christian thing? <laughs> no, it was a pagan fertility ritual celebrated on the equinox and it was moved and given a Christian frame in order to get the pagans to convert in Anglo-Saxon England. So all these are pagan rituals, uh, decorating the eggs, it symbolizes fertilization. The Easter egg hunt, just like the sperm hunts for the egg. It, sympathetic magic, as I also talk about in this video, doing an act to influence something that you want to happen in nature or within ourselves. Next one, uh, the Porskiris. Uh, this is uh, a tradition uh, practiced uh, in Sweden, but even more so in Eastern Europe. You gently, <laughs> gently spank a woman's behind with a twig, preferably from the birch tree, uh, which was the um, one most common in the traditions. And that is believed to bring uh, fertility to the women. Also is a good time to contact and connect with hares, just like the Easter bunny. This is all pagan fertility rituals, again, related to sympathetic magic. Hares, and they don't say breed like rabbits for no reason. It's because they are the most breeding things, and this is also the time uh, where humans would uh, uh, be trying to have children and do those types of things, all related to uh, fertility. So if you want to celebrate Easter as a pagan, just do everything you do on Easter normally, but do it on the equinox instead. Uh, also, this is a time of year where uh, games and competitions would be held in order to decide who the May Queen would be. Next one, we have Siegerblut, uh, the victory sacrifice. It's the start of the summer, and remember, uh, there are only two seasons in the Norse calendar, summer and winter, so this is, we're halfway through the year now, and this is the start of summer. Now, we only have two Norse uh, uh, saga sources covering the Sigeblut 
Ynglinga Saga and also Olav Tryggvason Saga, and we don't know much about them other than it was a sacrifice for victory for the coming year. So, of course, victory, Odin is going to be the one uh, who is sacrificed to if you are doing any uh, here. Next, we have uh, Valpurgisnacht or Valbjergsnacht, uh, April 30th to May 1st. A lot of you in Europe may know of this as May Day, um, but I think that's the only place in the world it's uh, still celebrated. I don't think it's anywhere else. Again, it's a pagan original celebration renamed to the Christian Saint Valpurga, Valpurgisnacht. And all signs point to this being a holiday being uh, originally celebrated by pagans in order to ward off evil spirits for the coming season. There's traditions all over the world, but Germany today definitely uh, does the best job at celebrating it. Uh, Maypole is brought up, decorated with birch uh, trees and leaves, singing, dancing, costumes, and also pranks. Uh, the bonfire, or Valboigsbull, uh, ward off evil spirits with loud noises and herbs. Uh, also another tradition recorded, kiss under a blossoming cherry tree was recorded to be like kind of a fertility thing done in Scandinavia. You can also leave offerings of bread, butter, and honey, um, and you leave that at trees or grave mounds. And here is when the May King and Queen uh, that were determined on the equinox Today is the day where they are made official. So the May Queen and King were decided by the games and the winner of the games on the equinox. But this is the time we make it official. So this is also a good time for marriages if any of you are engaged and looking for a date to plan it. Also, now is when uh, the uh, seed sowing and planting uh, would start to happen in uh, agricultural societies and also people trying to get pregnant. We do these things at a similar time, so it influences the other, and we try to get uh, positive effects uh, mutually. Again, always sympathetic magic. Also, a cool one recorded in Scandinavia, look for bird signs. Um, in Germany, we have this recorded too. The cuckoo bird is best. Uh, if a bird calls from the north, it's a sign that things are going to go your way, and good things are coming during the coming year. If the bird calls from the south, it means you can do the harvest for the coming year, even if it's going to be dry weather. If you hear the bird call from the west, it means someone is going to get sick or die. If you hear the bird call from the east, it means happiness and marriage are coming for you. Next one, we have Skuklafalsdager, or Pinsa. Um, this is mainly celebrated in Scandinavia. It's supposedly Christian, but again, lots uh, much older pagan uh, rituals uh, tied to this. Uh, Vega calls this holiday uh, Skuklafalsdager. It's the day where the uh, Skukla, the plows, were taken off of the horses. So this is the time where the last of the planting and sowing uh, for the agricultural season uh, would be taking place. It should all be finished by now. You can go fishing at this time. Uh, the Primstav here shows a fish on this day. You can eat calf steak. This is actually recorded in Heimskringla. So calf, good time to eat there. You can also make an oath of bravery. So commit to doing something brave for the summer. It's also a very old Finnish tradition, actually, I thought I'd include, that Pinsa is the last chance to get a girlfriend or boyfriend for the summer. So if you're single, <laughs> you better hurry up before this date. Then on to the summer solstice, the summer solvife. Uh, and again, there are no Norse records of the solstices being celebrated, but of course they did. All humans did. And next year, it's going to be June 23rd. Uh, there's some records from Scandinavian folk tradition and even ones that are still celebrated today. The Swedes actually um, have the strongest tradition of celebrating it. Uh, the bonfire is central and you should be throwing nine different herbs into the fire. You can also jump over the fire safely and, and have other games uh, and have fun with those things there has been the tradition. You can have many smaller bonfires that you light on the hills and mountaintops and also along the coasts. This is supposed to represent Brisingamen, Freya's amber necklace. And uh, then we have the Midsommastang, uh, the midsummer pole decorated with herbs and flowers like you have seen in Sweden mainly. 
uh, gather mugwort and St. John's wort. So this is very important, and these are done to ward off evil spirits for the rest of the year, and they are both in peak season now, so that's when they would be foraged and dried and kept around the house all year to ward off bad spirits. You can also find a sacred well, get some water from it, and sprinkle the water onto the land. You girls can wear flower crowns. You can also leave offerings on the grave mounds. Um, we have recorded and singing and dancing on the grave mounds uh, during the night if any are near you. Also Scandinavian tradition to skinny dip in the uh, midnight swim. Beautiful holiday and probably the most ancient one we have. It's celebrating the longest day of the year. Then we have a couple months of nothing. And th this year it's even longer due to the additional leap month we have to put in. And guys, this is for a good reason. Ancient humans would have been very, very busy on the farms from about July until the harvest time. This is two to three months of working very long days. So now this is a great time if you have any projects or goals for yourself. This is the perfect time these few months with not much else going on. It's a perfect time to power down and accomplish your goals and missions. It's in our DNA to be the hardest working time of year right now. I know that me too. I'm there right now and I can't wait till the hard work slows down in a couple months. Uh, there is one holiday in the Celtic world. There is Lamas, which we have some evidence of a Norse equivalent for, but I didn't include that this year. I'll maybe do that in next year's calendar. The equinox is really the next holiday that comes up. The fall equinox, we have some of those traditions preserved. Uh, the most important one is gathering mistletoe. You can do it by throwing stones at it, according to the Swedish tradition, or you can use a golden tool to cut it, according to the old Celtic Druid tradition. Uh, you cut down the mistletoe, uh, but don't hang it up yet. This has to do with the death of Baldr and his coming back to life. I remember, watch my video on that, and you take the mistletoe down, basically, and you don't hang it up until uh, the uh, winter solstice. Also, at this time, there is supposed to be no meat until the Hausblut. It's not a very uh, long time um, but this year, but it's still, according to tradition, that is the right thing to do. Games and sports are also in top season now. It's no coincidence that most of our modern day sports, their season starts in the fall. It was the same in ancient times. Things were starting to slow down on the farm and there would be less work and there would be more time to play some games and competitions. The Olympics of ancient Greece are a perfect example that used to be right at this time of year. Also, bonfires are a great thing to practice uh, at the uh, fall equinox. The next and final one is the Hausblut, uh, the harvest sacrifice. Um, this one is difficult. In Gisla Saga, uh, from the Viking Age, the Hausblut was actually on Vetternate, the winter nights, the new year. And it's the next full moon starting off the new year. Uh, but there are just more sources saying that the winter night sacrifices were for other things, such as good luck, good health to themselves, to the elves, to the Dísir. Um, so also in Scandinavia, Vetternater and the start of winter, the harvest had already come and it's going to be too late for a harvest sacrifice now. So it just makes sense that maybe in September time there would have been a sacrifice to make the harvest good that would take place in the coming weeks. Uh, so that's why I put it on this date. Uh, here is the time to sacrifice sheep or goats if you have any. Uh, harvesting the latest vegetables would also be done there. Uh, you can also make and eat forikol as in tr uh, Scandinavian tradition at this time of year. One of my favorite Norwegian recipes using lamb and cabbage which I will maybe do a video about in the next few weeks. And you can also know the kind of typical German October uh, fest type celebrations are a great thing to do at this year which is actually starting uh, in September so a great idea to do here if you have any October fest types of things this is probably a cognate of what the Norse Hausblut would be like and then guys that's it we're all the way back to the new year and I will be making another calendar then next year for 2023 to 2024 
So that's all it is guys. That's pretty much the full explanation of the flag and, and a guide so you guys can look through it yourself. You can get the calendar on my site. Uh, Patreon supporters get it for free along with many other things that I send out uh, to them throughout the year. Um, there will also be a cheaper uh, digital downloadable file of the flag uh, coming too if you would rather have that. But that so that's all for today. I hope you guys have a wonderful year and can practice these traditions as best you can. I uh, would love to hear all of your experiences if you have any things planned and I'll be sharing some of my plans uh, following these things too throughout the coming year. So that's all for today. Have you say us next